For those who are alive and remain, would you please turn with me to the book of Solomon, Song of Solomon. You know where it is, right? Song of Solomon. It's in the poetic books. It's between the two black covers, page 990. Yes, it is. Thank you. And if you wouldn't mind standing with me as we honor the reading of God's word. Second, uh, chapter 2, Song of Solomon, chapter 2. And I'm going to read, beginning at verse 8. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my love, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies, until the day break and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart, upon the mountains of Bether. Lord God, I thank you for your word. Lord, it is eternal truth. It will never pass away, not one jot, not one tittle. Heaven and earth will pass away, Lord, but your word will remain. And upon your word, O oh God, do we build our lives. Upon your word, Lord, do we hope in the future. God, I ask today that you'll anoint the preaching of your word. Lord, I pray that it will come forth with the power and the authority and the purpose that you have determined. I ask God that it would find its mark upon the hearts of your people, that it will do the work, O oh God, that you have intended. I pray, Lord, in everything that Jesus Christ would be exalted in this. We ask it, Lord, for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. The title of my message this morning, Spring is in the Air. Amen. Spring is in the Air. This song or poem is written by King Solomon, the son, of da or the son of David. Now there's a lot of controversy that surrounds this poem, this book of the Bible. Because it's, uh, and so, so the interpretation is not clear for, uh, for many. It's different than any of, uh, any of the other books. It, it's poetic, but it's not like the Psalms. It's poetic, but it's not like Job or like Ecclesiastes. It's historical, but it's not like any of the books of history. And so, because it stands out alone, it is different than anything else, it's hard to interpret. Many people have many different opinions upon the interpretation of this book. Some of the early theologians, th or early uh, interpreters or translators, saw it simply as allegorical. They simply saw the allegory in this. They did not see the real distinct persons or personalities represented in this poem or in this song. And so they interpreted it simply as an allegory. You know, in an allegory, there's something there. There's a story there, and it's a nice story, and, and maybe there might be some truths in it, but, but surely nothing to live by. No doctrine, no theology. It's just an allegory. It's just a nice story. And so many theologians, even in your commentaries, maybe even in some of your Bibles, um, the commentary will say that it is an allegory. There's another interpretation of the Song of Solomon, and this is, uh, some people interpret it simply as, um, as erotic letters written from one lover to another. 
Now, if you've ever read Song of Solomon in its entirety, there's, there's some very graphic language in there, uh, a very intimate uh, graphic language about uh, a man's love for his bride. And, in it, in, and so people just saw it as erotic love letters, one lover to another, and, and written simply from that perspective. Maybe it was King Solomon, maybe not. There's a third school of interpretation that I adhere to, and it is the typical view. When I say typical, I don't mean like everybody else, but typical in, in typology. I believe that this, I believe the Song of Solomon in its entirety is, is written, its types and its figures and its shadows of things to come. See, God has intended, God allowed the Song of Solomon to remain in Holy Scripture. Now, there are a lot of other books um, uh, passed down through the ages, epistles and writings that were excluded from Holy Canon, from Holy Scripture. God, in, by the Holy Spirit, has seen fit to include this and to protect it and to preserve this song as part of holy writ, as part of the scriptures. And so if God has seen fit to keep the Song of Solomon in the Bible, there must be spiritual significance to this book. And there must be truths that are applicable, truths that should be dear to us, things that believers should hold as meaningful and make application. And so when I look at the Song of Solomon, I see in the Song of Solomon the types and the figures and the shadows of things to come. I see in the Song of Solomon um, the love of Christ for his church. Solomon being the, uh, the king, being the Lord and, and his bride, the church. I see in the Song of Solomon pictures of the rapture of the church and the, uh, the millennial reign of Christ. I see all of these things in this Song of Solomon. Now, as you look at your comments in your Bibles and in your commentaries, some people may say that I'm all washed up and say, well, there's, there's really, you know, I read one commentary in, in one of the Bibles that I have, and it said um, that the, the person who wrote the commentary said, I have seen so many, so many strange things that people have tried to make of the Song of Solomon. Well, friends, I don't think it's strange at all. If it's in God's word, then God's represented there. There must be biblical, godly truths. And so I want to just bring out a couple of things from this small text that we read this morning that I believe God has in store for us today. First of all, the voice of my beloved. It says, the voice of my beloved. Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. Verse 8. When you think of leaping and skipping, what do you think of? I think of joy. You go tell your children, you know, we're going for ice cream after church and see what they do. They leap and they'll skip and they'll, it's joy. And I see in this picture, a picture of the Savior coming, leaping and skipping upon the mountains in joy. He was coming to redeem his people. He was coming to find his bride. And so he came leaping and, and rejoicing. You know, he left, we sang it this morning, he left the splendor of heaven. He left his place in, in glory to come to seek and to save that which was lost. It was the joy of the Lord to redeem mankind. I see in this a picture of the joy of the Savior, the seeking Savior. Now bear with me. When we talk about seeking Savior, it's not like Jesus came and, and you know, where are those rascals? Where? He, didn't come, he didn't come looking for us like, like he had no idea where we were from the foundation of the world before the world existed. God in his infinite knowledge and in his, pre, his foreknowledge knew exactly where we were and, and where we would be. Amen? When he came to me seeking me, it wasn't because he didn't know where I was. That word seeking is like somebody who comes to draw you out. He, you know, he, he, he came to find us where we were. He came to, to come and draw us to himself. The seeking Savior, he, know, he knew your life before it ever existed, before the world existed, he knew. He comes looking for us in this respect. Not, for, not because we're lost from his sight, but because we're lost from his fold. Because we're lost from his presence, because we've, we've left his presence, and so he comes to seek us and to bring us back. And he says here that he was standing behind the wall, peering through the lattice. Friends, the Lord has been in the shadows of our lives, our whole lives. 
As if, as if he was standing behind a wall and calling our names. You know, he's been there the whole time. Now, maybe we didn't see him clearly, but, he, but he's been there behind the wall the whole time. Some of you sitting here tonight, today have come recently to know the Lord. I say recently within the past year or two, maybe some even in more recent than that. You've come just recently to, to know the Lord as your Savior. And for you, it might seem like suddenly, like all of a sudden your eyes were opened, all of a sudden your ears were opened, all of a sudden you were enlightened, all of a sudden you understood. Friends, I've said this for years. When you come to Christ Jesus, you get smart. Right? You become a genius. I'm telling you the truth. Oh, you, come, you become a thousand times brighter than you ever were because all of a sudden, when you come to Christ and you know him, everything makes sense. Well, everything. Life, uh, yes. There are a lot of things we'll never understand. But all of a sudden, you realize, that's why this happened. That's why. And it all starts to come together. The puzzle, all the pieces fit. And you say, now I understand. Now I know of his love for me. Now I know of his grace. Now I know why that happened. And it all begins to make sense. You become instantly genius. And you could tell, go ahead, don't be afraid to tell people. <laughs> I know more than you. <laughs> and so it's come, you, 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 you've been enlightened. You've been suddenly, suddenly, you know and understand so many more things. Some of you have been raised in the church. You grew up with the, with the knowledge of him. You remember back in Sunday school, you know, you learned about, you know, God told Noah to build him an archie archie. And, you know, you, you, knew, you learned the songs of, uh, of Sunday school. And you learned the songs of missionettes and royal rangers. And, you know, you learned to, uh, you memorized certain verses of scripture. And you, you, know, you know all the right things to say and all the right things to do and in the right place. You, you've learned all those things, but, but it was just religious knowledge to you up until that moment. When, when all of a sudden from out from behind the wall, Jesus stepped and he spoke and he called your name. And when he called your name, all of a sudden you understood. All of a sudden it became clear to you. Listen, there comes that moment when it all makes sense. Maybe you're listening today and you've never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's been a religious understanding. Christmas, you know Christmas. You're the baby in the manger and the, and the wise men and the star in the east. And you know, you know, you know Easter. You, uh, you know that uh, soon we'll be celebrating Palm Sunday where they cast the palm branches at his feet in the triumphal entry, and you know that. And you know about the death on the cross and, and, the, and the burial in the grave and, and the resurrection on the third day. You, you know those things. Those things have been you know, uh, indelibly placed in your mind from, from childhood. But it's, but it's all just religious expressions. It's just religious knowledge. And you have never had a personal relationship with a risen Lord. You've never known him to be your personal savior. My friend, he's been there all along. Amen. Behind the wall, as it were, but he's been there all along. And he says that he looks through the lattice of the window. It's like looking through lattice. Have you ever looked through lattice? You know lattices, that X pattern stuff around your porch or whatever it is in your garden? You ever look through it? I, I don't mean put your eye right on the hole. I mean from a near distance. You look through the lattice and you see, you can see what's going on in your neighbor's yard. Well, you see something. You see that there's somebody there. She's not quite sure who. You, you see that there's motion. And maybe you can make out the colors of the things that they're wearing, but you're not quite sure what they're wearing. You're not quite sure who they are or what they're doing. You're looking through lattice. And friends, the Bible here says that, that he, looks, he comes looking through the lattice. We, we don't see him clearly. We, like looking through lattice, you can make out something, but not quite who it is. We're not quite sure or aware of his presence in our lives. But then Jesus speaks. He said, says that my beloved spoke, and, and when he spoke, when... when from out from behind the wall and be out from behind the lattice when he called your name and you heard that name, you heard him call your name and all of a sudden you knew. 
You knew who he was. The Bible says that, that, that Jesus knows his sheep. They, they know his voice. He speaks and the sheep hear his voice and they follow him. And Jesus came to you on that day and he spoke your name and you heard and you said, yes, that's my savior. That's what I've been looking for my whole life. I knew there was something, but now I found it. Now I know Jesus has called out to you. And when he spoke, you see, friends, I remember glimmers in my life, don't you? Glimmers of, when he was there in the shadows, I remember glimmers of opportunity to know him. Witnesses, people came right to me, and I didn't quite hear. I, I, was, I had opportunity, as you did. Maybe somebody witnessed to you years and years ago. Maybe there was a co-worker who was a Christian, and you looked at them you know, with, all their, with their big Bible, and you said, what a goofball. Whatever else it was. You had opportunities in your life and, and you never took those opportunities. I remember, I could look now through the lattice and I could see those glimmers of opportunity when Christ was there. Oh, but when he spoke, church, when he spoke, it wasn't in, until that night when he revealed himself and he stepped out from behind that wall and I met him face to face and he changed my life and the same holds true for you. Those of you who responded to his call, you met him face to face. It may be that he's calling some of you even today. It may be that he's been behind the wall and you've only seen through the lattice, but today he's calling you. Today might be the very day that he steps out from behind the wall on your behalf. And today might be the day that you actually discern his voice and hear him calling you. And you come to meet him face to face, I pray and hope that that's the case. Listen to this. He calls his bride his fair one. Anyone ever call you that? My fair one? Has anybody ever referred to you in terms like that? My fair one? Now, husbands, learn this. <laughs> uh, have, has anybody ever referred to you as my fair one? Listen, no one... No one loves you like Jesus is going to love you. No one loves you like he has and always will love you. Friend, nobody loves you like Jesus. And yet I've seen oh, over and over again through the years people doing incredible things to try and find love. Like that old country song, looking for love in all the wrong places. I've seen people give away precious things for the sake of love trying to be loved, trying to hope to, to earn and, and win somebody's love. Friends, God doesn't require anything of you. He loves you as you are. Amen. More than you can understand. He loves us. We are his fair ones. Look it. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6 that we are accepted in the beloved. Just listen to this. Just listen for a moment. You, you who have come to Christ are, listen, we have separated ourselves from God because of our sin. That's a fact. That's why, just let me put it to you this way. That's why there's anxiety in our hearts. That's why from time to time before Christ, we're afraid of dying. Not quite sure where we're going to go. We hope we did good, but we're not, we're not quite sure if we did good enough. We're afraid of death. We're afraid of God. Come on, be honest. Before Christ, there's some little concern about about God and, and the day you'll face him. And there's some anxiety about life and, and all of these hold true. We, because we have sinned, because we've se been separated from him because of our sin. And now the Bible says that through Jesus Christ, who perfectly obeyed the Father, who perfectly surrendered to the will of God, God looks upon Jesus and says, that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And if we come to God through Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we're clothed with his righteousness. Amen. And so, as Paul said in Ephesians, we are accepted in the beloved. No longer are we separated from God, but when he looks down upon us, he sees Christ and we are accepted. And he calls us his fair one through Jesus Christ. He, and, and we are accepted and acceptable. We could come into his presence, the Bible says, with boldness. We can come with confidence knowing that he loves us and he welcomes us into his presence. This is what it, he says, my fair one, my fair one, come with me. He says, rise up, rise, rise up. Well, that requires a decision on your part, does it not? 
to rise up. If somebody said, come here, rise up, it's going to, recall, it's going to require a decision. Now, you can go on sleeping, <clears throat> hopefully not this morning. I honestly, I don't understand how anyone could sleep while I'm preaching. Not because it's interesting, just because I'm so obnoxious. I'm so loud, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> you, don't, you could go on sleeping, but when he says arise, it requires a decision. You have to make it, it's a choice. I'm going to go on sitting where I am, or I'm going to get up and I'm going to arise. He says arise, my beloved, arise. Listen, if you hear him today, then I ask you, come and greet him. Come to him this morning. If you hear him step out from behind the wall and call your name, my beloved, I love, then you respond and you come to him. You come. Spring is in the air. It's the title of the message. It's my second point. Spring is in the air. Springtime is a time for new beginnings. Tuesday is the first day of spring, right? Is it Tuesday? Tuesday. First day of spring. Oh, my favorite time of the year. Listen to what the Bible says. It says in our text, the winter is past. Everybody said amen. amen. The winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The darkness and the cold of the winter is past. The sunlight lingers. Daylight saving time. The world grows greener. Watch how fast. You'll be cutting your grass in no time. The bass start jumping as the dragonflies begin to reappear. Oh, this is a wonderful time of the year. Springtime. It's a picture of new life. It's a picture of new beginnings. I love it. Listen, a picture of new life. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All of the junk and clutter and garbage of our lives, all of the fear and anxiety and loneliness and discouragement and depression, all of those things are past. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. The sin and the guilt and the fear, all gone. It's the springtime. We have a new beginning in Christ and we are new creatures. Jesus gives us a new start and new life. I hate winter, even a non-winter like we had this past season. Hate it. The trees are bare. You don't know if they're alive or dead. Might as well just be dead. <laughs> the ground is brown and hard. The skies are gray. No flowers. Uh, it gets dark early. You go to work, it's dark. You get out, it's dark. It's just dark. It's dreary. It's cold. It's wet. I hate winter. Did I say I hate winter? I hate winter. There's nothing, no, all right, Christmas, let it snow like crazy Christmas Eve and be gone by New Year's and I'm perfectly happy. Other than that, you know, it's dreary and it's cold and most people go into some form of winter depression, seasonal depression. It's dark, it's dreary. My wife too loves the winter. I don't understand it. Hate it, hate it, hate it. Dark and dreary and cold and wet and all, all those things. But friends, when the spring comes, spring is in the air. I woke up this morning to birds singing. Amen. I love it. I lay there, I lay there for, for five or ten minutes just listening to the birds sing. And you listen, you know, and, and they repeat, they, they answer each other. They, one bird calls the other, you know, it's springtime. It's new beginnings. They're, it's a, it, they're, they're finding their mates and all that. It's all beautiful. Birds singing, flowers blooming, green grass, trees. I love it. Springtime. Warm and bright. Everything seems better and more hopeful in spring, doesn't it? Everything is more, it just seems better and more hopeful. Friends, what I'm saying is this. Everything seems better and more hopeful in a relationship with the Lord. Everything is brighter, everything is warmer, everything is more hopeful. Everything's better with Christ. You're never alone, you, you, you never have to worry, he's there, present with you. Listen, if you have tried just about everything else, 
I'm not asking you to try Jesus. No, I will never, I will never demean my Lord in such a manner to say, try Jesus. You don't try Jesus. You take him or you leave him. Amen. But if you've tried everything else, take Jesus and find the hope that I'm talking about this morning. Maybe you've tried everything else. Look it. You could, you could go out and drink to try and drown your sorrows. I remember those days. I remember that, you know, drinking to drown your sorrows will take care of it for a couple hours. You know, you, you forget about all your problems. And then you wake up in the morning, and they're all there, plus some new ones. Because you find out some of the things you did while you were dancing half naked on the bar. You know what I'm saying? Don't, you know, but you've tried that. You've tried the drugs. You've tried the sex. You've tried uh, work. Some people throw themselves into work and, and into their future and into their career. They're going to build more and get promoted and get a better name and all those things. Friends, don't you realize how empty that is? The Bible says that the world passeth away and the desires of the world pass away. It's all temporal. It's, all, it's just a flash in a bucket, a drop in a bucket. It's gone. Listen, it's like chasing your tail, like a dog chasing his tail. What does he do when he finally catches it? It's like, it's like chasing uh, an empty dream, chasing after the wind, as the Bible says. There's nothing there when you finally get there. And we, we look for so many things to try and answer the questions of our hearts. Friends, listen, many studies, I don't have them here, but trust me, go home and look it up yourself. Many studies prove that a deeply committed Christian has a life with greater peace than those Amen. without. Amen. Let me just do a scientific study here. How many people have found more peace in Christ than before you knew him? Yeah. Both hands up. Listen, it's a fact. Scientific fact. Check the, the, the records of, of studies that prove a deeply committed... I'm not talking about a passing glance... I'm not talking about religion, relig religion, relig religious, religiosity. I'll never say that word again in public. I'm talking about a deeply committed Christian, one who knows their Savior, their lives are built upon the truth of his word, walking in his presence, sold out. There's a deeper peace, a sense of peace. No, you need, there's not going to be all of the counseling and all of the drugs and all of the problems because you know your Savior lives. And you're never alone. You don't ever have to worry about who I could call to talk to. You could call Jesus. You could get on your knees. You could close your eyes and just mention his name. The song says it's as close as the mention of his name. Just whisper his name. Just shout his name. Jesus, I need you. And he's present with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Always loved and always having a sense of worth. There's a realization that, that this life is only temporal, that the world is passing away, that none of this really matters in the end. And there's an eternity of peace ahead of us. The Bible says a peace that passes knowledge, a peace that passes your ability to understand. I mean, it's in the midst of trouble, you'll say, I don't, well, I don't know why I have such peace. But I could, I could shout and dance right now. Everything's falling apart around me, but I know my Redeemer liveth. And somehow or another, I'm going to be okay. My God promised me that he won't leave me. He promised me that he'll never forsake me. It is well with my soul. This will all be over and I'll be in his presence forever. Hallelujah. And there's that sense of peace. Spring is in the air. Thirdly, he says, arise and come away. Now, what I see in this second call, and I'm not alone in this. I'm not alone in this. As I said, many don't see anything more than an erotic allegory here. I see and hear in this song and in this text the prophetic voice of God. This is a love letter to, his, to the Lord's bride. It's a love letter to his bride where he says, My fair one, come away with me, my love. The pulpit commentary says this, it may be that in that second call, we may discern an anticipation of the midnight cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye forth to meet him. 
Look at this. He says, arise. My fair one, arise. He's come dancing and leaping upon the mountains as he sought us out, as he stepped out from behind the wall, behind the lattice, and he called us by our name. And he said, arise and come. Spring is in the air. It's a time of new beginnings. This is, this is a born again experience. This is to be a, a new creature in Christ Jesus. And then he says again, come away with me. Arise and come away with me. And in this poetic language and in this prophetic voice, I see in this his second calling. I see in this the call of the midnight cry of the bridegroom. Remember in the, in the New Testament parable, well, Jesus gives the parable of the ten, the ten virgins. Five of them are watchful, ready. They have their lamps trimmed and their oil filled. Five are not ready. And the bridegroom comes in the midnight hour and he calls, come away with me. Five are ready. And they go into the marriage chamber and the doors are shut. Five are not ready and there's nothing they could do to prepare and they're left behind. I see in this the second calling. I see in this the call of the Lord Jesus Christ to his bride in the, in the rapture of the church. Come away with me. Come away with me. Arise. And he, it says that the fig tree put forth her green figs. Do you see that? The f say, oh, Pastor, you're reading too much into this. It's the word of God, friends. I, I can't help but see uh, the, the, the prophetic voice of God in this. The fig tree put forth her green figs. In the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, verses 31 through 33... And it's, Jesus said, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of uh, the heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. I believe the budding of the fig tree, the fig tree with its green leaves appearing, is none other than the return of Israel to a nation. I believe as many others do that the budding of the fig tree is referring to Israel's arising in 1948, May 14th, when it once again became a nation and the fig tree, Israel, budded. And I, and I see in this now the picture of the Lord's return, his near return. Now the bridegroom calls out again to the bride, arise, come away with me. Please note, I'm almost done. Please note that she's not ready. The bride is not ready. The perspective changes here in verse 15 from that of the bridegroom to that of the bride. Up until this point, it's the bridegroom who's speaking. It's, it, he's calling unto her. And now, in verse 15, it turns, and it's the bride who now speaks. Now it's written from her perspective. And she says to the bridegroom, Take away the foxes, the little foxes that spoileth the vines. Take away. She's asking the bridegroom to take away the little foxes that are spoiling the garden, that are spoiling the vine. It's poetic, remember. This is all poetic language. Now, she doesn't say, remove the big beasts that ravage our fields, that rip the stalks out of the ground. Remove those beasts. No, she says, remove the little foxes. It's the little foxes that spoil the vines. These little foxes were, were jackals, about no more than 15 inches big. There's just these little tiny animals that would come and frolic in the fields, frolic in the vineyards. And it was the little playfulness of the little foxes that were making the vines in a, unproductive and unfruitful. And she's saying in the poetic language, take away these little foxes that, that spoil the vine. Please note, the little foxes. Those things that appear to be harmless, if allowed to stay, will wreak havoc in your life, robbing you of fruitfulness. Those little things that seem to be no big deal, acceptable by, by so many. Those little things that it really doesn't hurt, doesn't really hinder, it's, it's not a big deal. It's a little fox in your field, a little fox in your vineyard, and it's those little foxes that will ruin your, your vineyards. Those things that you think you have control over will wind up controlling you. Those little things, those little foxes that seem to be so harmful. Oh, they're so cute. 
will wind up wreaking havoc in your lives, destroying your fruitfulness, robbing you of your joy, taking away from you that, the, the preparation and the readiness. And so you'll miss out on all those things that God has intended for you. The bride coming to realize that the bridegroom is calling her. She says, please catch these little foxes and remove them from our lives. Are you willing to say that this morning? Are you willing to say to the bridegroom, Lord, would you please catch these little foxes in my life? These little things that are, that are hindering the, 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 my fruitfulness, that are robbing me of my readiness, that are keeping me from being ready for you when you call me home. As I close, Lord, prepare me for thy coming. That's what I see her saying in this. Lord, prepare me for thy coming. Remove from my life even the little things that keep me from my readiness to meet you. Little foxes, remove them. Throughout this song, the bride plays cat and mouse with the bridegroom. Read it for yourself. He comes to her, he knocks upon the door, he even tries to reach through the door to open it, but she's sleeping. And when she comes to the door, he's gone. And we see that in various places. He comes and he calls and, and, she, and she's not ready. And he, she's playing cat and mouse with the, with the bridegroom until that moment when she falls in love with him. And all the games stop and all, all the, the games cease. And she is sold out to the beloved. Now she's just waiting for him to return and to take her away. Amen. Church, that's, Amen. that's how we should be. Lord, please remove the little foxes in my life. Lord, please remove the little things that hinder. Please, God, I don't want to play cat and mouse with you anymore. I don't want to play games with you anymore. Lord, I want to be sold out for you and ready for your calling. So when I hear your voice say, arise, come away with me, I'm there, Lord, I'm there. Because I've been watching and waiting for it all my life. See, until Jesus is all there is, friends, we're not ready to be called away. Is he all there is to you? Are you sold out there? Would you say this morning, Lord, please remove the little foxes from my life. Lord, I come to you this morning with all my heart. I'm, I'm just looking for you, God. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray, as we close? Lord, I want nothing more than for you to come into my life to remove all the obstacles, all the, the little things, God, the little foxes that spoil my, my vines, that spoil my fruitfulness, that make me not ready, Lord, to come away with you. Lord, I want to be sold out for you. Lord, would you speak this morning to those bowed in your presence? Would you, would you whisper their name again, Lord? Would you just call them and would you just tell them again of your love? Would you say to them, my fair one, my fair one, arise, my fair one, and come away with me? Lord, would you speak to the heart of the Christian, Lord, that has been uh, fearful or confused or, or has grown weak in anticipation? Lord, would you just speak to them and remind them again? You've called them, and you're calling them up again. Arise with me. Soon, Lord, you're going to come and call us out of this place. And we'll be with you forever. Well, Lord, would you remind them of your coming? God, for that one that might, one or, or more that might be bowed here today, Father, they have not heard you or seen you other than from behind the wall. Lord, you've been there in the shadows of their life. You've been calling them their whole life. There have been little signs and little glimmers of your presence, but like looking through the lattice, they've not been able to determine or discern that it was you or what you asked of them. But today, God, let them hear your voice, clearly speaking their name, calling them your fair one. Stepping out from behind the wall. God, let them see you face to face today. Let them know, oh God, that there is a greater hope and a, and a greater joy. And, and, and everything is so much better in Christ with the hope of eternal life. Lord, we know that we'll still have problems. We know, God, that there'll still be heartache. But we know, Lord, that in a relationship with you, we'll never be alone again. We'll never face these things on our own again. And when it's all said and done, You'll take us home to be with you. God, would you speak to every heart that's bowed in your presence today? I'm going to ask you while your heads are bowed, while you're praying. The Lord Jesus Christ loves you more than you could ever understand. And you, you might not, you might have had no 
recollection, no, no understanding of that at all. Maybe, maybe it's never even entered into your heart. You've been told, but it doesn't make any sense to you. But if you'll respond to his calling, if you'll answer him yes, you'll put your life in his hands, you'll know that love in a, in a very experiential way. You will know and sense and understand to some degree as much as we can understand his love. You'll know that you are his fair one. You'll know that you are in his beloved, that he loves you. You'll know his presence. You'll know that hope and that joy and that peace that he, only he could bring. I ask you, friend, you could go on sleeping, but, but he said to you, arise and come to me. Would you do that this morning? Maybe you're here and you've never given your life to Christ. You've never answered his calling. And this morning you hear it more clearly perhaps than you've ever heard. And this morning you would say, yes, Lord, I want you in my life. I want to come away with you, Lord. Yes. If you'll just raise your hand and let me know that so I can pray with you. Yes. There's a couple of hands have gone up. Anyone else you say, I, I mean this with all my heart. I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. I want to live for him. I want to serve him. I want, I want to know his presence in my life. Yes. Yes. Church, be reminded of his love today. Be reminded of his love that he left the glory and splendor of heaven. He came down with great joy, leaping and skipping upon the hills, looking for us, that he might find us and call us out of our darkness, out of our winter, into spring, into the new life that he's provided for us. He calls us by our names, draws us unto himself, and now he whispers to us, come away with me. Got a place prepared for you. Lord, I pray for those that are sitting here this morning, for those that have raised their hands. Lord, perhaps they have raised their hands before many, many times. Perhaps they have acknowledged you in their lives before. But God, maybe today it's different. Holy Spirit of God, only you, Lord, can reveal Christ. Only you, Lord, can make this message make sense. So I pray, Lord, that you will drive it home into their hearts. Let this be a new beginning, Lord, truly a new, a new day for them. I ask for the rest of us, Lord God, that this word would, would give us courage and give us assurance, Lord, and, and, and give us hope again that soon, Lord, that there will be that midnight cry of the bridegroom, come away with me, and Lord, we'll enter into your marriage chamber and you'll shut the door and we'll be there with you forever. God, encourage hearts this morning. I pray, Master, in all of this, that this message would speak to each of us, Father, and, Lord, that you would be glorified. Lord, have your way in each of our lives, we pray this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to sing as we go.